So first, did Jesus exist? There are over 42 sources within 150 years of Jesus' death, which mention his existence and record many events in his life. As with all Christ mythers, Zeitgeist must do something with the non-biblical evidence, the historians, the writers who mention Jesus. It is a very difficult thing to come up with logical arguments to discount all of those sources. And, as a result, quote, no serious historians believe that Jesus didn't exist. Now, sure, you don't believe me when I say that, but when that's an exact quote from Bart Ehrman, the famous agnostic and author, Again, no serious historians believe that Jesus didn't exist. It tends to mean a little bit more. Richard Dawkins also, although not a historian, is in any event a very famous atheist, and he too concedes that Jesus, quote, probably existed. Michael Grant is an atheist historian, and he wrote this, To sum up, modern critical methods fail to support the Christ myth theory. It has again and again been answered and annihilated by first-ring scholars. In recent years, no serious scholar has ventured to postulate the non-historicity of Jesus, or at any rate, very few. And they have not succeeded in disposing of the much stronger, indeed very abundant, evidence to the contrary. This is what Zeitgeist the movie says about it. Quote, Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, Tacitus are the first three. Each one of their entries consists only of a few sentences at best, and only refer to Christus, or the Christ, which, in fact, is not a name, but a title. It means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. And that's all. That's all the time that Zeitgeist spends on debunking these historical sources. They don't go into any detail, they simply give these four reasons as to why we should discount the evidence. Number one, there are only four historians. Number two, only a few sentences. Number three, referred to only Christus or the Christ, which is in fact not a name but a title. It means the anointed one. And number four, Josephus has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Let's take the first one. There are only four historians. They word this really carefully because they know that there are many sources that show that Jesus existed, but only four of those sources are officially historians. This is actually an extremely high number of historians, and one has to wonder how many historians are needed in order for modern people to believe somebody existed. Is the magic number five? If it was the case that we needed more than four or four, we would not be able to confirm the existence of literally almost any figure in history. Four is a lot, especially considering the quality of those historians. Another reason that Zeitgeist gives is a similar thing. They say that there are only a few sentences devoted to Christ in these writings. So let's take a look at Tacitus. Tacitus was a first century Roman historian who lived through the reigns of over half a dozen Roman emperors. He was considered one of the greatest historians of ancient Rome. And he said this, Christus, the founder of the Christian name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. But the pernicious superstition, repressed for a time, broke out again, not only through Judea, where the mischief originated, but through the city of Rome also. Now, these may be a few sentences, but I'd say he did a good job as a quality historian to record the important points of Jesus' life from his perspective. He tells us, number one, that Jesus did exist. Number two, that Jesus was the founder of Christianity, so we know we're talking about the right guy. Jesus was put to death by Pilate. Christianity originated in Judea with Jesus, and later it spread to Rome. This also deals with the other point that Zeitgeist makes, which is that they only refer to Christus, which is not a title but a name. And that's a really flimsy argument because Tacitus makes sure that we know that he's talking about the founder of the Christian sect who was put to death by Pilate in Judea and that it spread to Rome. Tacitus simply referred to Jesus as it would have seemed right for him to record. All these people called Christians you know, get their name from the founder called Christ, which whether or not he knew that it was a title in Hebrew is irrelevant. If he was speaking of another guy who was named Christ, who was put to death by Pontius Pilate, who was the founder of a religion named Christianity in Judea that spread in large numbers to Rome, then it would be a pretty big coincidence if he was talking about another guy. The only real hope for them is that it was a forgery or that he was quoting Christian sources. And for both of those claims, I'll quote the divineevidence.com, a really good apologetics website, especially on this topic. 
She says, could Tacitus have taken his information from Christian sources? Because of his position as a professional historian and not as a commentator, it is more likely that Tacitus referenced government records over Christian testimony. It is possible that Tacitus received some of his information from his friend and fellow secular historian Pliny the Younger, yet if Tacitus referenced some of Pliny's sources, it would have been out of his character to have done so without critical investigation. An example of Tacitus criticizing testimony given to him even from his dear friend Pliny is found in Annals 55. Tacitus distinguishes between confirmed and hearsay accounts almost 70 times in this history. If he felt this account of Jesus was only a rumor or folklore, he would have issued his usual disclaimer that this account was unverified. Well, what about the idea that this passage could have been a Christian forgery? Judging by the critical undertones of this passage, it is highly unlikely. Tacitus refers to Christianity as a superstition and an insuppressible mischief. Furthermore, there is not a surviving copy of Tacitus' annals that does not contain this passage. And so there is no verifiable evidence whatsoever of tampering of any kind in this passage. Then Zeitgeist mentions Suetonius and Pliny the Younger as the other historians that mention Jesus. They again use the idea that it's only a few sentences. This idea that there are only a few sentences is usually to imply that there was some kind of forgery by Christians. But none of these passages are even candidates for possible forgeries. The argument is not advanced by even the sternest critics of these particular passages. Then Zeitgeist makes this bold claim about Josephus. They say that he has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. It's very important to understand the details of why they are claiming this. Now, Josephus was a guy that we should expect to hear from regarding Jesus, considering Josephus was a first century Pharisee and historian of both the priestly and royal ancestry, and he provided important insight into first century Judaism, and because he was only three years removed from the time of Jesus. He would have been a very credible witness and in a great place to do his investigations and collect historical data about the issue. For example, there are totally undisputed passages in Josephus to John the Baptist, Pontius Pilate, etc. The truth is, is that there is really only a small section of this writing about Jesus from Josephus that is disputed. And what I'm going to do is quote the passage in question, and I'm going to highlight in red the contested portions of this passage. At this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and the other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon their loyalty to him. They reported that he had appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly they believed that he was the Messiah, concerning whom the prophets had recounted wonders. So that may be a few sentences, but it's a really solid historical account, and it really does sum it up nicely. The problem is, is those two disclaimers in red, which appear in the Greek and Arabic versions of the Josephus manuscripts, but do not appear in the other translations. In other words, some manuscripts do not contain the words, they reported that, as in, they reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion, Accordingly, they believed also doesn't appear in the other manuscripts, so it simply says he was the Messiah, as opposed to they believed he was the Messiah. Josephus was not a Christian, so it would be very doubtful that he would not give the usual and necessary disclaimers like they reported that and they believed that, as it appears in the Greek and Arabic versions. Therefore, if there was forging, it was probably by erasing those disclaimers as opposed to adding words. So again, if there was forging, the existence of Jesus was not the focus of that forging. The focus was on him being the Messiah and on his resurrection. But even if you decided to throw this whole passage away, there's still a big problem for Zeitgeist regarding Josephus. There's a second passage given to us by Josephus, and it is not surrounded by as much controversy. In Antiquities, Josephus says, So Aeneas assembled a council of judges, and brought before it the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, whose name was James. Together with some others, and having accused them as lawbreakers, he delivered them over to be stoned. It must be noted that no copy of Antiquities has ever surfaced without the above quote quoted just as it is, Interesting here is the so-called Christ statement, rather than the Christ. 
This reference shows that Josephus was not condoning the belief, but simply documenting it. So it lends evidence to the other passage's proper reading as well. Also, this passage concerns the actions of the priest Aeneas. Jesus and James were not even the primary focus of this verse. And this passage is cited in other early works as well. So even if we dismiss the disputed words of Josephus, we still see that he testifies to a number of things in the two passages we quoted. Jesus lived in the first century, so he existed. He performed wonderful works. Some believed him to be the Christ. He was a teacher. He had many followers. He was tried by Pilate. He was crucified. He was the founder of Christianity. And finally, James was the brother of Jesus. All this, when Zeitgeist tells its listeners, Josephus has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Zeitgeist does not mention the other non-biblical references to Jesus. These references were primarily from his enemies, people that, as I have mentioned, would have loved to tell people that he was just a myth. And instead, it takes 1,700 years for people to start to claim this. One interesting note to put all this into perspective is Tiberius Caesar. He was the Roman emperor who reigned during Jesus' ministry. So, he was the most famous person alive in Jesus' time, from an earthly standpoint, that is. He has only 10 authors who mention his existence within 150 years of his life. These include Josephus, Tacitus, Suetonius, Seneca, Particlius, Plutarch, Pliny the Elder, and a few others. And, by the way, Luke, who is the Bible writer. But if you remove Luke, since he's a New Testament source, there are only nine non-Christian sources. This means that there are just as many non-Christian sources for Jesus' existence as there are for Tiberius Caesar's. And to compare the total number of sources between Jesus and Tiberius Caesar, it's 42 to 10 ratio. Therefore, there are over four times as many sources for Jesus' life and deeds than for Tiberius Caesar's. If one is going to doubt the existence of Jesus, one must completely reject the existence of Tiberius Caesar. In addition, I think the idea that Christians can't use the New Testament as evidence for the existence of Jesus is mostly kind of like Christians playing nice and sort of tying one arm behind their back to give the opposing side a fair fight, because Christ's existence is established clearly by the primary documents of the New Testament. Yes, skeptical writers would dismiss these, but to do so is irresponsible, since more than 5,000 Greek manuscripts in whole or part establish the body of the New Testament literature. All of the New Testament has been completed within 60 years or so of Jesus' death. Of those 27 books, no less than 10 were penned by personal companions of the Lord. These men claim to be reporting history, which is unlike any mythical account such as the tales of Horus, etc. These were reporting places, names, minute historical details that are amazingly accurate. If they were inaccurate, surely it would have been noted by the skeptics of the day. But again, that argument seems to have eluded everyone. Let's consider the following quotes from Sir William Ramsey, one of the greatest archaeologists in history. In his life, he did extensive archaeological work in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey. Entering into this work, he was an unbeliever who was thoroughly convinced that the book of Acts in the Bible was a complete product of the second century, a theory which was taught in the German schools of higher criticism during that time. As a matter of fact, one of his goals was to prove that the history given by Luke was inaccurate. However, his beliefs were drastically changed as his archaeological finds proved that the book of Acts was accurate to the minutest detail. As a result, Sir William Ramsey became a Christian. He writes, I may fairly claim to have entered on this investigation without prejudice in favor of the conclusion, which I shall now seek to justify to the reader. On the contrary, I began with a mind unfavorable to it. But more recently, I found myself brought into contact with the book of Acts as an authority for topography, antiquities, and the society of Asia Minor. It was gradually borne upon me that in various details the narrative showed marvelous truth. In fact, beginning with a fixed idea that the work was essentially a second century composition and never relying on its evidence as trustworthy for first century conditions, I gradually came to find a useful ally in some obscure and difficult investigations. Sir William Ramsey has a lot of quotes about Luke that are interesting to read, but I'll conclude with this one. He says, Luke is a historian of first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along with the very greatest of historians.